Yay! <laughs> it kept projecting my request. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Instagram has a mind of its own, but yeah. we are intrepid. They will not deny us this opportunity. Yes. Oh, hello. How are you doing? I am well. How are you? Pretty good. Good, good, good. Um, so I wanted to say hello to everyone who has joined us today for um, this Amplify America discussion about domestic and intimate partner violence um, with Nicole Castile. She is the program director for the Rose Andam Center in Denver. And they are celebrating everyone. Yeah, by our the... fifth anniversary. Congratulations. I, I actually want to jump in by, by talking with you about that. But first I want to say, if you have not listened to this episode of Amplify America, I encourage you to do so. I encourage you to share it with others. Um, it was a lengthy one. I found it very difficult to cut. <laughs> <laughs> I am not the best editor because I'm like, everybody should hear this. <laughs> I want them to hear everything. Um, and there were so many powerful moments in all three of the interviews I did. Um, I had the pleasure of interviewing Rose Andam herself, which was like one of my great life honors because she is such an incredible person as an entrepreneur, but also for someone to be have to have been so generous about sharing her personal story. It was amazing that she shared that with us. And so I'm going to be doing more with what she shared about her life in general outside of this particular project um, in the weeks to come. But it was an honor to have that. So thank you so much for connecting us. Um, and then Absolutely. we also have Lynn, who is the president and CEO of the National Coalition Against um, Domestic Violence. And she shared her personal story, but also her work as an expert and an advocate and how all of those things were intertwined. Um, and she, she had some very powerful insights about her journey personally, but also her professional journey and knowing what her limitations were and how things affected her. So a huge part of the work that I do with this um, effort is to get you to understand that advocates are human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you are on the front lines of doing this work and helping people through difficult situations and traumas, it can be very, very challenging. Um, and so I was so happy and honored that she got to share that. So there are so many levels of things that you're going to get when you sit down and listen to this. I got a couple of text messages from friends who are like, you know, your interviews are always really heavy, but I feel like when I, at the end of it, I come out on the other side, I feel empowered. So, you know, it's a big gift to, to actually hear that from someone because that is really the purpose. It's like sometimes you got to get into the muck and the mire to get to the promised land. So um, thank you guys for supporting this work continuously. Um, again, go back and listen to this interview if you haven't. Um, listen to it again. Share it with other people. Listen to it with other people. And, and think about what's happening where you live in your community around this particular issue. Think about the relationships that you have with other people where you've seen some of these signs that we brought up in the interview as well, and I'm sure we'll talk about today. And then think about what is happening right now in this historical moment with all of the things that are going on in the world and how those things add pressure to the pot that generally generates um, domestic and intermittent partner and violence. But I have a personal thing that I wanted to share because when I was heading through it, and I was thinking through it, one of the things that got me, Nicole, was I did not think that I had experienced domestic violence because I have not been in an intimate partner relationship where that was present. But I grew up in a household where that was present. Right. It never occurred to me until I was having that conversation and somebody was like, well, you experienced that. I was like, oh, I had no clue. Like it never occurred to me. Of course, it had an impact on me and it had an impact on me on how I saw myself how I saw other people in relationships, what kind of choices I made. So I kind of want to, I want us to kind of get into that because I think something similar happened in the space of like the sexual trauma interview that I did, where mm -hmm. in generations before there was such a cultural acceptance of this type of behavior. Um, one could say it was due to toxic masculinity. One could say, you know, dominant gender roles and if you fit into them or not and what the expectations were. But um, we're, this is a little bit of a freestyle. We kind of exchanged emails yesterday and Nicole's like, what are we going to talk about? I was like, you know, I don't want to do like a formal interview. People say that they missed the conversational part of me. So let's, let's just have a conversation. But um, 
I wanted to kind of start there and then go back to the celebration of your fifth anniversary and, and kind of how things have evolved with you all through COVID and what COVID looks like now and, mm -hmm. and how operating that's a big part that I want to talk about. But I want to kind of start with the beginning of this, which is for me, our personal awareness of domestic and intimate partner violence and what you think people are on the day-to-day -day kind of understanding about it, maybe missing about it, and so they're not capturing it and they're not really um, thinking through how they can um, deal with it, both personally and professionally. Sure. Yeah, the first thing that comes to my mind is just about like all of the sort of normal things that contribute to domestic violence that we think of, we don't think of as the potential for domestic violence, but be, can become fodder for that. Um, we recently did a volunteer and internship training and we talked about economic abuse. And I think that that's a really good example because you know, finances are a topic that a lot of people feel really afraid to discuss. There's a lot of shame around finances. It's not something that we as a culture feel very comfortable being open about. And a lot of the traditional things people do, which is to like share, have a joint bank account or share resources or maybe having one partner dependent on the other while they're staying home with the kids. All of that seems very like normal and innocuous, but in the, a relationship where there's power and control, that becomes the very grounds by which economic abuse can happen. And we then have clients that come to us who've had their credit destroyed or they've never had their own bank account, um, or you know, it's even being able to put away a little money on the side is nearly impossible because their partner has been tracking their bank statements and their credit card statements. So for me, I think that's that's one of the top examples I can think of. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting when I went to your website and when I went to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence website and I saw how extensive the financial literacy piece of this, and also the financial recovery piece of this was, mm -hmm. it struck me as one of those things that I don't think that we've actually discussed. And I was like, this is extraordinary because, you know, I know when in my chosen family, like my nephew, they have an extensive financial literacy course at, you know, his, his you know, country day school or whatever. And that's mm -hmm. not something that every generation kind of grew up with. But think about power and control and coercion. I mean, there's no more frightening space for that to occur than in one's finances because then they don't have the agency to really move on from that. But that kind of goes to also what you all do at the Rose Andam Center. So let me kind of go back just for the people who don't know about your work. Um, you are in Denver, Colorado. Um, you are endowed by the amazing and wonderful Rose Andam. Um, she is someone who grew up in a situation where domestic violence was present. She was also in a relationship where domestic violence was present. She's an extraordinary entrepreneur who owned several um, McDonald's restaurants in the Denver airport. She went to the mayor and had a conversation and said, I want to get back and what, you know, what am I going to do? And he asked her what she was passionate about. And she said domestic violence. And so that's a little bit of the story about how it came together. I want you to fill in the blanks of that a little bit. But your work in counseling and support and protection and the fact that it is a one-stop shop, it's such an incredible national model that a lot of people are trying to get to. So I want you to talk a little bit about what it is that you guys do, how it's unique and hopefully becoming more normative, and why it is so helpful to this population in, in this critical time. Sure. So in many places, um, if someone's a victim of domestic violence, They'll go to a community-based organization, um, and that organization will pair them with an advocate. And the advocate will find ways to connect them to all the resources they might need. So that might be a legal resource or counseling, housing, but none of those agencies are in that domestic violence organization. They're out in the community. They require that you build good relationships. Um, they're also, in many ways, like different fields, so there's not a lot of shared knowledge. Um, but a victim will need all of those resources to be able to get their life um, back to a place where they feel empowered and, and they're thriving. And so what's unique about Rosandum Center is 
we're this big collaborative. So we're a place where you come into the building, you meet with an advocate, and we have all those partners here under one roof. And so, you know, a client can decide that they're going to make a police report and they can have an advocate there with them. They might need medical care and we have a full service clinic on site. Um, maybe they'll want to have their kids get services. So we have partners that are providing services to children and youth. And what's really special about the collaboration is that not only are we able to help the survivors get what they need in one day or you know, over a period of months, but we also train each other. We, we improve the way in which we serve um, victims and survivors of domestic violence because we're always learning. Um, and you get people and um, organizations that maybe never mingled before and they're really building a community which ultimately benefits survivors because they see there's a whole community that's wrapping support around them. I just think that's extraordinary. Um, you know, I remember when I was having an interview with Rose and also when I've done some of this work locally or when I did it in undergraduate um, years ago, I mean, you couldn't find people who understood the language of domestic violence, precisely what domestic violence was, let alone could find one of the things that you just talked about, you know, to help them try to navigate this. So being able to have a place where there's sort of wraparound services where people are constantly interacting with each other. And I love the, the best part of what you said is we're getting better because our interaction with each other is informing the work that we do. It's sharpening it. It's making it more um, efficacious for the people that we're trying to serve. And Ultimately, that's in anything that we do, that's what we want, right? And so mm -hmm. I love to hear how that's evolving. So, I mean, how long have you been with the Rose Andam Center? And then in the five year period of it, what do you know about how this um, center has evolved over time and how you've done your work a little bit better every year? Sure. So, uh, five years is, um, as I would say, is we are toddlers in terms of the nonprofit uh, space. We're still very young. Um, and I've been with the center for two years now. Um, and most of that time was during a pandemic. So, it's been a very interesting time to be here um, as the center is really growing and developing. Um, I would say, probably, you know, and this is probably obvious, but the thing that we got the best at was being able to provide services remotely, which we are still doing. So we have our doors open, we can accept walk-ins on a daily basis. Um, but I would say at least two thirds of our clients are still um, preferring to have their services remote. So and primarily over the phone. Um, and that was something that when I started here, we didn't do at all. We, you know, we were really about getting people in we would, um, and we still do, but we would have them come by Lyft and they would be here in the building because so much of the identity of the organization is around the building, which, which is wonderful and beautiful. Um, but also it can be a challenge for clients that are coming from some distance. Um, and also right now what we're hearing is that many clients, you know, they haven't really left their homes, you know, during much of the pandemic. So it would be notable if they were to suddenly leave to try to get services. So it's much easier for them to find a private time to be able to, to reach out. Um, so I would say that that's been a big shift. The other yeah. piece is just that the organization has grown massively. Um, we see a lot of clients here. So, you know, on average, we, we would do 1400 new intakes a day. Um, and our team has I, I don't know, it has exponentially grown. So we've, you know, we, when I started here, we had one person, our guest navigator, who answered the phones and welcomed all of the guests. And now we have, you know, at least 15 volunteers and interns that do all of that support. They're answering the phones remotely. We have people in the building. So we've really grown to, to meet the need and the demand for services. Okay, so... Bravo for being able to make that pivot, but that also tells us something really troubling, right? That the demand is there. So what can you tell us about pre-pandemic, you know, pandemic and where we are now as far as like the demand increasing? Sure. So I think that what we saw most notably was that the cases were much more complicated. 
um, and in particular around housing and, and economic stabilization. So, you know, I think that in the past, you know, we would of course have clients that needed to look for affordable housing, et cetera. But now because of the economic impact and also what's happening in Denver, which is that the cost of living is spiking right now. So Denver is undergoing a really big boom. There's a lot of gentrification. And so folks that have been here for generations are really struggling to even be able to afford a one bedroom apartment. So all of that contributed to a really high need for services around um, housing stabilization. We also had a lot of clients come back to us, which is also not uncommon, but I think it speaks to the complexity of their lives during the pandemic. Um, and then as you know, you know, so many women had to leave their jobs um, during the pandemic. They became the, you know, the caregivers for their children and, and relatives. And that also put a strain on them and made it more complicated for them to be able to flee abusive relationships. Yeah, and so as you all shifted to, to meet that need, were the resources available? I mean, I know in our interview, we're like, look, we've shifted from, you know, providing legal resources to trying to figure out this housing piece. And with everything that's happened with the safety net from COVID being um, something that is, you know, stopped um, with regard to unemployment, with regard to um, mortgage and, and rent, um, what are you what are you trying to navigate with and are you finding partners who are willing to help you hotels and things of that nature who are trying to help you or is it really at a crisis point um i would say a little bit of both um so there were a lot of private organizations hotels as as you mentioned that were there for us are continuing to work with us and our clients um, and there, were, there was funding made available through the Colorado Office of Victims Assistance, uh, COVA, which mm. we tap into to be able to fund those hotel stays. So that was a brand new thing that happened as a result of the pandemic. So there, there were new things that came about. And also, I think that many of our organizations, in particular, some of our government partners and smaller nonprofits, they did take a loss uh, financially. And so, and I, I think that they're very much still in the rebuild process to building up those services. So I would say it's probably a bit of both. Okay. Um, I'm gonna stick with the resource needs right now. And, and then I'm gonna pivot to how we start to help people who are facing this challenge, think about it with what we're dealing with today. But I want us to take this time to think about the needs that you are seeing that you can anticipate that you're going to need going forward, especially. And I always think about this part of the year as, as a really um, lovely time for a lot of people. It's a lot of holidays. It's a lot of celebrations. But it's also a really scary time for a lot of people, right? So I, I always start to get energetically a little bit worried when like se in September comes around because you know all these holidays are coming up and either – there are points of wonderful celebration and gathering, or there are points of like a lot of pain for a lot of people. Yeah. So in this time of, of year also, people get really interestingly philanthropic, right? They want to start giving and they want to start saying, okay, well, how are we going to do the end of the year thing? And I always laugh at people when, when they say, well, April, what do you think about like giving back? And I'm like, look, I feel like Americans are very good at giving back Halloween to like Christmas. <laughs> right you know we want to do something for the kids for halloween we want to give a turkey for thanksgiving and food and then we want to do the gift cards for for christmas and you know hanukkah Kwanzaa, and whatever and all of those things are important but you want to one teach people how to fish um and and the other part of it is you want to have it so it's sustainable and it's not just this one feast or famine kind of thing so given that construct that i believe that a lot of americans have um, what do you want people to know about the kind of resources you need? And I, I'm saying this not just for average everyday people who are looking. I want you to address us and them. I also want you to think about if there's a business listening or someone who works for a corporation or someone who works for an entity where it's, you know, a private LLC and they're trying to figure out from a business perspective, how do I help? What are the ways that we can help? We talked about this in the interview where it was like, you can donate items you know, go to the websites and look specifically for what they have. But there, there could also be mentoring or also job opportunities. Talk to me a little bit about what do you need? 
because I know you have the needs and I know you have wonderful yeah. partners, but I know that the need is expanding every day. So what are the specific needs and how can these people kind of reach out to organizations like yours and meet that need? Yes. So I would say the big thing that I would want to call attention to is Camp Hope America. And so Camp Hope America is a branch of the Alliance for Hope, which is the national organization that the Rose Andam Center is under. And what it is, is it's a summer camp, um, lasts for uh, maybe about a week um, for all the kids whose parents are receiving services here. And it's an incredible program. This, will, this coming summer will be the first year that the Rose Andam Center has our own Camp Hope. Um, and what we really see it as is prevention. So I'm thinking about, you know, in Rose's interview where she mentioned, you know, when you grow up in a home where there's domestic violence, unfortunately, sometimes you might also become a perpetrator. We see this as the opportunity to have that intervention to provide more support to kids. And we just sent two of our staff members to a Camp Hope in California, and they came back just completely inspired like you know every day we're doing such difficult work and this is the opportunity for hope um, so in terms of how people could help out you know there are camp hope americas for a lot of family justice centers throughout the country and there are opportunities there where you could become a mentor um, they have a year-long pro mentorship program that goes along with camp hope called the pathways program mm -hmm. um, you could you could donate sleeping bags, um, camp gear that the kids might need because, you know, they, in many cases, they have never really been outdoors and they don't have that equipment. If you're a big corporate sponsor, like REI, for example, I think that that's a great way to either do in-kind donations or provide the financial support. So right now, I would say that is where I would want people to put their, their funding because that's the future. You know, we do have to make sure that there are the services available for folks who are in the most imminent crisis. But we also want this to end. And I think that that starts by investing in young people. Yeah, I love that. So to meet the need of let's end this, Camp Hope America, we just give you a shot. Mm -hmm. Amplifies America is following you and, and we also <laughs> our um, chat. So definitely. But you also have these day-to-day -day needs. You know, you have housing needs. You have um, material needs, mm -hmm. um, clients that you serve. I am sure that the Rose Andam Center isn't the only, you know, place in the, in the country doing this work. And, and what are the general needs that people on a local level who are like, okay, I've donated to Camp Hope America. I want to do more. What do I do for the House of Ruth? What do I do for New Directions in Ohio? What do I do for the Rose Andam Center? I mean, in this time, I really think financial assistance is the best. Um, I think there's a lot of goodwill when folks, you know, want to donate clothing or furniture, things like that. But I think in many cases, we don't have the infrastructure to manage all of that. We're small organizations, right? So, and we do need funding to meet our, you know, basic operating expenses. And, you know, when you're running a domestic violence shelter, you're receiving probably a combination of funding from local and federal government and small private philanthropy. So we really do also rely on individual giving. And about this time of the year, you're going to start seeing the end of year appeals coming out. It would be a great time to donate. Many of the organizations will also start to have their, their galas in October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So that's another great opportunity to make a financial donation. I want to amplify what you just said because um, the turkeys are great, the gift cards are great, the candy for the kids and the toys are great. But I think that a lot of people don't understand how difficult it is for a nonprofit organization to be sustainable and you have mm -hmm. to be sustainable with money. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an assumption that, oh, we have this benefactor, Ms. Rosandum gave this money or whatever, but it's also like we have to sustain that. And as the need grows and as the services that we have to provide for folks to make sure that they're whole and well expands, that costs money. Um, so I just want to put an exclamation point on what you said. And I think you said it beautifully. I hope, I hope people heard what you said, um, that the money is not going down the drain and it's not paying for anything extravagant. It really is mm -hmm. paying for brass tax. So I think that's a really mm -hmm. good thing to say. 
Um, let's pivot a little bit to the hard part of what you do every day in helping people who are dealing with this. I, I really appreciated how you talked about, you know, it's just getting more complicated. Before, you know, the pandemic, people were coming in with this and we kind of understood that these were the kind of core things that they were going to need to deal with. And now with caretaking extended family members and kids being home longer and dealing with multiple generations, sometimes under one roof, it's just getting more complicated, which means also more intense. And like you said, less likely that you're going to be able to find that little bit of time to plan, time, find mm -hmm. that little bit of time to talk to someone and to feel safe talking to someone. So if you could speak to someone who might be dealing with this in this moment, they are completely overwhelmed, um, they're in pain, and they are trying to figure out how to take the first step to getting help and to sorting this out, what would you say to them? I would say that they could reach out, you know, by phone or by text messages in some cases to the local organization in their area. If not also the national network, the national hotline, I would say would be another great resource. And even if they don't quite know what they need, just being able to start to surface what they're experiencing and how they feel, I think would be a great first step. Yeah. The, the other thing I have to say is when I actually did the research for this episode nationally and locally, I was amazed by how much better the resources on these websites are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you talk a little bit about when someone is navigating, say, your website or a national website or, or a website in their area, can you tell them what it is they should be looking for for emotional needs, what they should be looking for for tactical needs like that legal that legal piece and what they should be thinking about for, you know, the, the support space um, as sure. they're kind of through it. Sure. So I would say for the first one for counseling, I would really recommend that folks start with a domestic violence organization. And that's because I think that there are some well-meaning people, you know, maybe they're running couples counseling um, even some therapists that for whom that might not have been their specialization that aren't going to give the best advice. Um, what we know about domestic violence is because it's a, a pattern of power and control. Couples counseling does not work for domestic violence. So for that, I would say really starting with your domestic violence organization, they usually offer like a traditional DV counseling. So that's just helping the client to look at their relationship and understand what might be happening there in terms of intimate partner violence. Um, then they can also help make a great recommendation or referral to a therapist for, that has that skill set. So I would say that that's something to, to be thoughtful of when you're Googling and you're trying to find the right fit for the counseling piece. Um, in terms of legal support, this would all fall under the domain what we call uh, civil legal advocacy. And, you know, in Colorado and in Denver, we're very lucky. We have a, a unique organization that provides support called Project Safeguard that, and they do all of our civil legal advocacy and they're knowledgeable on domestic violence. For, or, for states or for communities where they don't have that, sometimes the DV organization will provide it, but you can also go to your family court. And the family court usually has an advocate on staff that can help explain the paperwork that you might need for a restraining order, an order of protection, um, anything having to do with custody. Uh, so that's what I would say for the, for the legal piece. And then the other pieces, the financial pieces, that again, I would say the DV organization can direct you to self-sufficiency resources that you might need, or if you have like a general human service um, organization in your area. So like we have Denver Human Services, and there's likely um, a very similar type of organization because they're run by the municipal governments that you should be able to connect to in your um, community. But again, a DV organization should be able to connect you to all of those entities. Okay. I am someone who is in this right now and I am having a really hard time. I'm emotionally bereft. I am exhausted. I'm also really, really scared. How mm -hmm. do you get my nervous system calm enough <laughs> to navigate this. I mean, I have had the lived experience of dealing with loved ones, friends who have been in challenging positions. And I think the hardest part 
is getting them calm enough to think that they can start this path. And I think there are a lot of people who really, 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 really want to help themselves and to do better, but are just petrified to do so. Um, and I know that you guys see this every day. So like when you, once they get there, it took something for them to get there. Once they picked up yeah. that phone, it took something for them to pick up that phone. So what do you say to the person who might be lurking around and, and stuck, who may come across mm -hmm. the, this, this video and say, okay, well, I got that, I got that. That seems overwhelming to me. I'm not sure if I'm ready to do that. Mm -hmm. I, how do you, let, let's go Harvard Divinity School on them, right? <laughs> We're doing, we're doing a Buddhist Christian thing here and we're, we're trying to, to wrap something around people to hold the space for them to say, okay, I get it. I understand you're, you're afraid. I understand that you, you really don't know which way to go. What would you say to them? So I would say two things. One, and I, th I think this would also just be more also from what we know about trauma being stored in the body is that really like some very good deep breathing, some light walking, um, there's a wonderful book that just came out, My Grandmother's Hands, that talks about the way in which trauma is stored in the body. And a, a lot of the ways in which, you know, things that we, you know, we ask people to stay still or to not like express themselves. And that is actually difficult for them when they have trauma. Part of the way we release the trauma is through the movement. So there's a lot of yes. great, um, there are a lot of great resources out there about trauma-informed yoga, deep belly breathing. Yes which calms the, the, the system down so that you can be able to be present again. So I would say those types of modalities would be excellent to, to use throughout the process. And then I think the other piece is just knowing that it is a process. Uh, and, and even if you can't, if you take one step forward and two steps back, that's okay. Like just keep, keep going. And it may take a long time. Um, but I think sometimes folks feel like if it doesn't get fixed today, it's hopeless or, and what we want to share is like, we're going to be here for the long road. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons people go back and we understand that and we're still going to be here for you. Um, and I think the domestic violence advocate is, is that compassionate, non judgmental person that's going to be with you, you know, and no matter, you know, if you, how long, however long it takes. Um, so I would say that those would be the two pieces that I would want people to hold on to and they think about reaching out. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I, I think that um, one of the things that I would add is that you have to do your best to find an ally. Um, it can be someone in your household. It can be someone outside of your household. It can be someone you um, are social with. It could be somebody that you work with, but you have to find a safe space if you can to navigate this so that you know that you're not alone. Um, and then if you can do your very best to kind of release any kind of cultural shame or guilt around your situation, um, mm -hmm. because you find that it's more normative than not. And the other thing I would say is to, to, to do some research and listen to people who have gone through this. Like I saw an mm -hmm. interview with this woman, Cece, that you guys worked with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just look at Cece and you're like, oh my God, she is a vision. She looks like joy. You would never know that she mm -hmm. came through this. So there are tons of examples out there of people who have had this experience, who have sought out the resources. Cece said, what? This is the best call I've ever made, mm -hmm. right? It just completely changed her life. So I just want to be of encouragement to people to, to let them know that there are examples out there that can reinforce what it is that they want to experience and um, also allow them to take a turn and a pivot away from what they are in in this moment. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say about the current state of affairs of the Rose Andam Center, um, how you guys are navigating this part of COVID? Because when I talked to you, you were at a, we were at a certain part in this COVID journey. I can't even say what the COVID journey is right now because I really don't. <laughs> right? I'm like, is it going to end ever? Like, what is happening? Like, can I touch people again? I don't know. So, you know, what, what are you guys dealing with it? How is it different than the last time we had this conversation? Yeah, so I think we spoke in March. So I think I was home again at that point. We were in and then out and then it. So um, I think that we're optimistic, but there's still caution, right? So we're now in the place where by October, 
most people are going to need boosters. Um, So it's not where I think we totally thought we were going to be, which was like vaccinated and free and clear. Like we, we're still, you know, wearing masks when we're in common spaces, meeting with clients. As I mentioned, two thirds of our clients are still preferring um, services remotely. We -hmm. largely do have our partners back in the building, except uh, for childcare, which, you know, that's really dependent on vaccination rates of children. So I would say we're optimistic, but we are moving probably at a more cautious and slower pace than probably we would have anticipated in March. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You're celebrating. How does that look? Five years. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Um, I think it's just been so great to hear from all of the people who sat around tables for years and have this as their dream and vision and to have them just reflect on where we are now. So, and and we also just had a new family justice center open up in a neighboring uh, county. It's called Porch Light and they're in Jefferson County. So we're starting to see, yeah, we're starting to see the growth there. I think there are rumblings that there might be another one, um, hopefully starting in maybe Boulder County. Uh, So I think that really the model is, is bearing out to show that this is a really unique and successful model. And I also would say, like, want to lift up our collaboration with our system-based partners. So that would be um, the district attorney's office, uh, the, uh, uh, the DV detectives. And, you know, what we're really seeing is that they value the Rose Andam Center and our partnership because they want to provide victims with a very comfortable, uh, dignified place to receive services. Um, and so, you know, I think that those partnerships, well, and I think I touched on this when we first talked, which is like those uh, collaborations and partnerships are not the norm in, in a lot of places. And we have a really heightened tension right now um, in the country because of a police brutality and revisioning the criminal justice system. I think that family justice centers are one place where you can see positive collaboration happening. We're not perfect, but we're getting better. And you know, one heartwarming thing you see is that when the DV detectives are here, they start to soften too. You know, that we've heard stories of, you know, they start to see the full families and the children. And I think that we need to have collaborations like this um, so that we can really figure out how to work together for the sake of survivors. You know, I want to highlight what Rose said in the interview about um, wanting more consequences for perpetrators. And this is a complicated topic. You know, as, as we fight for criminal justice reform and we want to put an end to police brutality, we also need to look at, like, providing legal support for domestic violence victims who want that. Um, And I think the family justice centers are a positive place in which we can see that collaboration starting to happen. Yeah, I I gotta tell you, it's, I think we talked about this before where like both of us in our undergraduate years kind of came into contact with this space, right? You know, I, as a member of my local sorority and that was our, you know, our civic engagement, right? And how far it has come, you mm-hmm. know, before I felt like we were just kind of putting a band-aid on, you know, a, a huge gaping, you know, gushing geyser. And I didn't have a lot of hope. I got to tell you, I was like, this is terrible. How are we going to, mm-hmm. how are we going to do this? And to see all of these agencies and entities kind of come together and really say, okay, we've got to wrap ourselves around each other and figure this out. Um, it's just hopeful to me. Did it take yeah. 30 years? Sure, it took 30 years, but that's kind of how evolution happens. So I'm just right. grateful that it's happening. And I'm grateful again for Rose to have the vision to have endowed this um, with so much love and respect for herself and her family, but also other people who are going through this. And just, she's, she's right. so sober about it too, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that I think that sobriety, you know, with someone from her kind of background um, and all of all of her accomplishments, also allows us to say there is more to be done, mm-hmm. right? 
Like I'm doing my part and I want you to join me in doing my part. And it's not just on me. So let's all do this. And so I, I do really kind of appreciate that. And then the advocacy piece. So let's shift a little bit to the advocacy piece because I know in our conversations, there's some things that have happened on the national level since our conversation. Um, and then there are more things to be done. So we know what we can do in the volunteer space. We know what we can do in the giving space. What should we be thinking about with regard to the complex murky policy space of all of this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we're still very much in process. One of the, the things that I want to highlight is we just finished doing the NNEDV, so that's the National Network to End Domestic Violence One Day Count, if folks are familiar with that. That is a survey that every domestic violence organization in the country is encouraged to submit. And that is critical for policy work. So what we do is we talk about the number of clients we served over the phone in person, and we also highlight unmet needs. So what happens then is the national network and domestic violence uses that data to inform suggested policy changes or to even provide um, some information on how we might spend funding that might become available um, differently. So what I would say is that it's going to be really interesting to see if the, um, what the survey says now versus pre-pandemic. I also noticed that they have, uh, they have asked the questions in a, a little bit more um, uh, comp comprehensive way than in previous years that we've completed the survey. So. I, I would say we're still in process and I would want to see what the results of uh, the NNEDB survey are and, and see what their national policy recommendations would be. Okay. So we should all go to that website at, at one point to check that Yes, and they have the previous years. Um, so they do an executive summary that you can look at that talks about um, trends. Can you tell us what that website is again? Sure, it's um, nnedv.org. So it stands for the National Network to End Domestic Violence. Perfect, and we also did an organization card for this episode for them as well. Um, you're doing this work every day. We talked about self-care in the interview. How are you doing? Pretty good. <laughs> I would say pretty good. I saw um, you talk this weekend, so I was like, yeah, you yeah. Talk to nature. I <laughs> I escape to the mountains every weekend. <laughs> that does help. Um, I really love being back in the office with our team. We have a really joyful team and that has been very intentional. Um, I think that it's really hard to do the work in isolation. And what I really tried to shift about myself in the pandemic and even about my leadership style um, is to be much more um, collaborative. So really be intentional about shared leadership um, because I think a lot of burnout can come when you feel like you're it. Like if you, you're you so responsible for everyone and through various things that you know shifted and different things that I started to observe actually um, with trends in our movement, I really started to try to build leadership among our team in a way that we're not a flat organization by any means, but we, it is, we really are much more collaborative. And I think that that helps too, um, because we don't all need to be at 110% on the daily basis for us to keep in the work. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my heart just exploded when you said joy. Um, tell me how that's possible. Um, for our team, I think one big thing we do is we celebrate our wins. So we use Microsoft Teams um, and we have a channel called The Wins. It's like all in caps with like four exclamation points. And we encourage people to post their wins. And there are really big stories in there. And there are stories of the collaborations. There are stories of things that we thought were impossible that happened in like short timelines that you know, just speak to like that never give up attitude and it's hard work for sure. And the collaborations are not always smooth, but the advocates who are diligent and they, they, they really make it happen. And so I think really being thoughtful and um, 
I don't think it's like this anymore, but I think sometimes people were bashful to share their wins. And, you know, one team member said, but we all need that, those wins. Like we, we need that. And then you see a new team member come up and they'll post their first win, like celebrating a successful application that they received funding for. And so I think it, that's important. And we also like just do silly things together. <laughs> so one of our interns, um, had kittens and she brought like a whole box of kittens to a staff meeting <laughs> and we we share a lot of meals together so things like that um I think that that keeps us going you know it goes back to um <clears throat> my 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 friend who sent the text and said you know that was a really heavy interview but I felt like there was so much hope in the end mm -hmm. I think that that's really what this whole effort of Amplify America is about, and, and you know, the Roseanne Center is is so pivotal to that because it takes love and tenacity and patience to face such a huge social issue. Um, and and I think we tend to kind of doom scroll everything mm -hmm. as a when I absolutely believe that we have the capacity on every level, it doesn't matter like what your socioeconomic or educational background is, you have some social capital. Mm -hmm. So you can do something to help ameliorate these problems. And I think your organization and your work and the people who work there every day, but also the people who volunteer um, and who sow any kind of seed into the work that you do are kind of proof of this whole concept that I have for Amplify America, which is we can face these very challenging issues we can do it head on, we can do it soberly, we can unpack you know, what the impact is on local communities, but also on us nationally. We can start to think about the ways that policies need to shift, you know, that our mentality about these issues need to shift and how we need to interact with each other collab more collaboratively and more compassionately around these things. And we can get to the wins. I mean, that is right. like the way from our conversation right now that like in all of this, there is joy in all of this, there is celebration. In all of this, there are wins. And we're going to go back to Camp Hope America. I'm going to plug them again. <laughs> because we want this to end, right? Like, I don't want to have this conversation 30 years from now. I don't, I don't even want to be talking about it, right? Like, I wanted to be like, that was something that happened in the past. And this is what we did as a progression to end this. So I love that, you know, you're also in the business while you're helping to end this, right? And so I... I can't thank you and Rose and Margaret and your whole team enough for the work that you do. Um, what a perfect way to um, honor the Amplify America mission of showing that, you know, average everyday people can have these experiences, go to an organization, you know, be handled lovingly by advocates and, you know, have empowered lives. And then we can look at that as a witness and say, all right, what am I doing? in DC? What am I doing in Denver? What am I doing in Dana Point? You know, what am I doing to help? And so hopefully somebody will see this and be inspired. Um, if it's not happening to you, it's probably happening in your community somewhere around you, somebody you care about, that you will be more mindful, that you will have tools so that you can um, help someone, help yourself, um, and that you will be inspired to help, to give money, to give support, to post about it. Posting is really important. It's just as important as any dime that you could give, although we need your dimes. Um, that, that, that's what we do. Um, you know, I have an engaged page on the Amplify America website where I have this, this post where it says, you know, what is the issue? What are the solutions? Who's doing this work? You know, what are the ways in which you can give back? If you're at a loss for how to have some organization about that, go visit that page and, and make use of that tool. But again, dig into these websites. Websites are so much better than what they used to be. I went to yeah. under at people. <laughs> so <laughs> you can use the internet any way you want. You can also <laughs> use social media any way you want. So I guarantee you, if you put a hashtag in and said domestic intimate partner violence, you will find so much stuff. If you Google domestic intimate partner violence, you will find so much stuff. So the information is there. We're not at a loss for the information or for the organizations on a national level or on a, or on a local level. We're at a loss for your attention. Right. And I right. always say to people, whatever has your attention owns you. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be powerful, 
<clears throat> if you want to be a part of the solution, you can find the information out there and you can find a whole course of people who are willing to work with you and to support you in whatever it is that you want to do. Um, but it's your choice. So we're always hoping that your choice that you will choose. Hey, Russ, we are always hoping that your choice is that you choose to amplify America. So Nicole, I, you know, you keep giving me all the goods. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, April. The waves in the hair is very pretty. <laughs> Thanks. The COVID hair. <laughs> <laughs> COVID hair, right? We all got, oh, you have no idea about the COVID hair. But um, no, thank you so much for your work. I'm so glad to have met you. I'm so glad that you're a part of my life now and, and a part of the Amplify America team. Hopefully, we will make this a TV show and you guys will be on an episode because I cannot wait to see the Roseanne Center. And by the way, when I was doing research, I thought, um, I saw this article where it was like, oh, the Rose Andam Center got hit when there was the Black Lives Matter protests and there was a whole yeah. thing. So there is such an intersectionality between the things that are happening in the world and how people are feeling and what people are yeah. doing. There are all these layers. And I cannot wait to keep telling these stories about how in spite of all of these things, we are coming together to do this work. So yes. thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank Absolutely. You, thank Margaret for me. I will. <laughs> When you talk to Rose, tell her, ah, I'm still like overwhelmed by that interview. It was amazing. Yeah. It was really, really well done. Really well done. Oh man, she, ooh, I mean, chills. Like I, I yeah. did not, but she said so much and I have a whole nother level of respect for the McDonald's Corporation and, and a lot mm -hmm. of it going. I had no clue, no idea. Um, and what she was able to do with her life by those opportunities. It was just so remarkably inspiring. So I am grateful for you that you have a work environment where you're doing this really challenging work and you have that kind of support. So bravo to you all, all and thank goodness for the model. And, and like I said, hopefully people will come across this and be like, how does she have joy doing this? Let me <laughs> call them up about their corporate culture. What's going on there? Cause a whole lot of people don't have joy and they work <laughs> in spaces, right? So that to me is huge. So I, I, I could gush on you all day and I probably will in some other ways, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, April. And showed up today. Um, I hope that you got something out of this. I hope that it was inspiring to you. And uh, our next episode is coming in a couple of days. It is on sexual violence and trauma in Alaska. Whew. Wow. Well, let me tell you something. These people are not playing with this work. And um, the other ones that are coming after that, we got human trafficking in DC and um, elder care and elder abuse in Wyoming. So we're working through it. <clears throat> and we have people all over this country who no matter what the issue is, are in it every day working to love on the people that they live with and make things better. So um, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank hope you. Find the last days of summer. <laughs> and uh, the newness of fall and just remember to look out for yourself but also look out for others and continue to amplify america have a great day take care <laughs>